Good afternoon. I think we're ready to get started again. The afternoon will be dedicated to two additional technical sessions before uh, the poster session and the, the uh, networking and refreshment session. Um, so the, the next uh, uh, area that we're going to discuss is uh, retail AI. Um, and is, a, is an interesting area that combines sort of a number of uh, computational and mathematical tools that have been traditionally developed in operational research with uh, new technology driven by uh, uh, availability of data and, and, and sort of machine learning type algorithms. Um, now, unfortunately, uh, we have a, a sort of a, a little bit of a difficulty in this session because uh, one of our speakers um, uh, uh, could not really uh, be here because of uh, COVID restriction. Um, so, but we'll, uh, we'll make up the time. We have uh, here um, uh, two, uh, um, uh, uh, two speakers being uh, present and discussing the, the, uh, uh, their work and their application. And then uh, uh, Ashwin Rao, who is a uh, adjunct faculty at, uh, in ICME and leads, uh, um, uh, together with a uh, uh, couple of faculty, the uh, mathematical computational finance track in, in ICME will, will be giving a sort of an introduction to the topic and, and an introduction to the speakers. So um, Ashwin should be uh, in, on video, so we'll let that get started and then uh, we'll continue with the session. Here, here is Ashwin, okay. I'll uh, take the next Thank you all for participating in person for these exciting set of, set of research topics today. My name is Ashwin Rao. I am an adjunct professor in ICME. My research and teaching is in the field of reinforcement learning with applications in finance and retail. I'm also the chief science officer of Wayfair, which is an e-commerce retail company. For this session, we are defining retail quite broadly. Basically, any business involving selling consumer products in physical stores or online so what kind of AI problems do we have in retail and how do we go about solving them? Well, big picture, I like to split the problems into two buckets. Bucket one involves creating significant efficiencies in internal processes, operations, and planning, which in turn reduces costs enormously. Think about problems like inventory management, delivery logistics, customer service, but here I'm also including transport and labor planning, pricing, and even long-term decisions on growth investments versus quarterly profitability. Bucket two involves providing great customer experiences, things like search relevancy, personalized recommendations, and appropriate marketing. Let me start with bucket one. A lot of these problems on processes, operations, and planning were traditionally studied and solved both in academia and practice under the banners of either operations research or economics. We are proud to have made massive acad academic contributions in this space here at Stanford. And much of the techniques developed through academic research have indeed been leveraged by retail companies in how they move inventory plan space and throughput and make pricing decisions. Now we have the exciting opportunity to blend the traditional techniques from OR and economics with modern techniques from machine learning. In particular, I want to highlight that demand forecasting benefits a lot from deep learning, particularly by leveraging the predictive powers of neural network transformers, which is a form of self-attention that has been a game changer for text and images, and now promises to be a game changer for many forecasting problems in retail. I also want to highlight that the recent developments in reinforcement learning are enabling us to solve stochastic control problems and operations in more efficient ways than the traditional techniques from dynamic programming. For bucket one, I'm also excited about the opportunities in leveraging recent advances in causal inference for various important business decisions. However, I must warn that this requires careful investment in data organization, healthy engineering practices, and a culture of experimentation, validation, and feedback cycles 
for learning various kinds of cause and effect in one's business. Now let me move on to bucket two, providing great customer experiences. Over the past couple of decades, tech companies have demonstrated the power of machine learning for high quality search relevancy, personalized recommendations, and marketing at the right time and in the right context. This set of problems seems like something that is getting increasingly commoditized through open source libraries. However, in practice, things are not so easy. It requires scientists to sweat considerably in tweaking their models and hyperparameters to get a satisfactory level of performance in their algorithms. Also to make these algorithms work, one requires large amounts of data on customers. This is actually not the case in many retail businesses. It's not only that many customers are sparse shoppers, it's also that the privacy landscape is becoming increasingly restrictive. This requires careful and appropriate use of AI algorithms. A core technique that has worked remarkably well is in the training of neural network embeddings for each customer and, each, and for each product we are selling. Another set of algorithms that have worked quite well here are the algorithms for the problem of multi-armed bandits, a form of continuous A-B testing adapted to these customer experience problems. So the bottom line is that retail businesses are pushing on increasing automation in internal operations, as well as in providing customers with great experiences and value. This is all happening due to significant progression in AI capabilities. Now, let me put on my practitioner hat and tell you that to make AI work in retail, it is not only investments in mathematical models and algorithms, it is also investments in solid data engineering and software engineering to train and deploy models based on AI, it is important that scientists and engineers have reliable data, have a sound platform to experiment, have ability to deploy at scale, and most importantly, to automate the process of learning from the limitations of AI models so that one can go back and improve those models. We'll move to the next speaker um, who is uh, uh, Blake Johnson. Blake is an adjunct professor, professor in the uh, Department of uh, Man Management Science and Engineering, MSME, um, and uh, um, he uh, has a, sort of an extensive uh, experience in this field, um, especially um, incorporating uh, uncertainty uh, in, in uh, demand and supply uh, chains and also um, in uh, working uh, uh, connect in connection to customer, connecting the, the uh, requirements of the customer, the suppliers, and, and partners for companies. Yeah, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Um, I wanted to start with just a little bit of kind of context on my own career, how I got to where I am, and, and hopefully um, I mentioned that just because I think some of the things that you'll see embedded as, as techniques and what I do hopefully have broader relevance um, that may be of interest uh, to you for that point. So actually, interesting, like, like Ashwin, uh, we both came out of a finance background, um, both in, on Wall Street and in the academic world. I was previously full-time faculty in MSNE, originally hired as a finance professor. Um, but I was always interested in investing in investments in real things. That's how I ended up in the technologies, et cetera. That's how I ended up in the, uh, in the engineering school. Um, and But then what I... Uh, what attracted me to the more supply chain, operational, retail stuff was the repeated nature of the problem, the massive kind of operational scale, and all of that um, led into you know, the topics that we'll be talking about today. Um, but specifically, why I mentioned the finance side of things is that uh, finance, you know, as you know, is good at things like risk, uh, valuation, um, flexibility, all things to do with uncertainty and value and risk management in an uncertain environment. And as the recent history has made very clear, that is also true in supply chains and in retail and otherwise. And so um, surprisingly, that was not the, the practice within supply chains and operations. 
uncertainty is basically almost completely ignored. And so that became my slice of life, uh, and that's what I wanted to talk about today. But I, what the broader theme that I wanted to draw out is, you know, what you'll see is essentially um, trying to fit stochastic processes, stochastic models at a mass scale. You know, like every single product, every single sales location, maybe every single customer segment. And also the stochastic behavior of a product and its demand is, is quite complicated. It's non-stationary, it has life cycles, seasonality, et cetera. So um, I think hopefully what will be interesting is, um, you know, ways to go about doing that, that that we've evolved over the course of time. So the first, uh, this slide is just sort of, you know, I only have a couple slides, but this is the intro slide for the, the few slides. So this is just saying, hey, look, you know, realistically, always been true, but, you know, the world is making it uh, extremely obvious to us that if you are a company trying to get the right product to the right customer, you face a lot of uncertainty. Um, and the main thing, you know, the, the word planning in this environment really means that, um, you know, to get that toilet paper on the shelf in COVID-19, you know, a lot of stuff had to happen well in advance. You know, trees had to grow, paper mills had to run, you know, paper had to get created, it had to get transported to the right place. Um, and so that's a long process. And so organizing that and sizing it appropriately for the end demand is, you know, crystal ball gazing, right? You know, that's, you know, maybe a nine month, year, whatever process. For toilet paper, we keep doing what we do, so we're usually okay. But if, you know, I work with a company like Nike, let's say, that's launching, you know, every season, thousands of new products and colors and shoes and what have you, they are doing the same thing, you know, a year in advance, guessing what, you know, we're gonna want for a short life cycle product. So basically, inherently, um, you know, people are making these long-term bets uh, on things that they're not gonna get meaningful information about until um, much longer after the fact. So we wanna, you know, essentially, if this is Las Vegas and we're placing bets, we wanna capture those odds as carefully as possible. And as I mentioned, you know, almost amazingly, supply chain operations, et cetera, rarely did that at all. You know, they would take a deterministic forecast and then they would strap an inventory buffer on at the end. So again, coming from, you know, a world where we have stochastic processes and finance and et cetera, we're like, that's crazy. You know, we have tools for this. So that's piece one. Then once you have that, then you think, all right, well, that's, you know, challenging because uh, I should say on these simplistic kind of stylized charts, the, the horizontal axis is time, right? So the length of that horizon is that, that lead time that I described that it takes to make whatever it is, you know, the customer is ultimately gonna buy. And then demand is on the vertical axis, and as you would expect, the further you out, you know, you have to gaze out into the future, the harder it's gonna be to predict what people are gonna do. So let's say we've done that, let's say our, you know, our stochastic process, our cone of uncertainty is represented by those dots. Um, you know, then we actually have to put stakes in the ground. And so that's where the risk analysis comes in. You know, and you know, essentially we don't want to have too much. There's cost of having too much. We don't want to have too little. There's cost of too little. But you know, since we have a significant area of uncertainty, we need to make risk adjusted bets. Um, and the interesting thing, this is where the kind of um, economics and physics of supply chains can really be leveraged, which is, can we see my, yeah, you can see that. So, just you know, kind of one stylized takeaway. If, if, if the bottom of this dotted line out here, maybe when we're first you know choosing our capacity, if our best guess, the middle of our our probability distribution is let's say 100, and that low end is say 70, what we can what we've done is find some degree of certainty, right? We've said yes, you know, future demand is uncertain, but you know, we've figured out that we want 70 for, you know, for sure. That's sort of our worst case. Supply chain people get really excited about that because they're like, okay, great. I can minimize cost on that. You know, I can do all the things that would be great if I knew I wanted something for sure. Um, but then by the same token, as we go up, essentially the probability of having demand at these higher and higher levels drop. 
Um, and so there are ways to create flexibility within supply chains, but there's usually some costs associated. Simplest one would be, okay, we can send it by air freight rather than by ocean freight. That's just a speeding up of transportation. But as you've heard maybe in the press, well, maybe we should make these products closer to home. Maybe we should do domestic manufacturing rather than manufacturing in a low cost company or you know, a whole bunch of things to do. So essentially, as soon as we opened up this visibility to this distribution, then we had sort of a, a cost versus risk or risk versus return optimization that we could apply. And what that meant is you would typically have multiple modes of production. So you'd have the lowest cost mode that served your extremely high probability demand and then you know, much higher costs, but much more flexible or dynamic supply chains that would hit uh, that upper part. Um, so that was kind of, you know, hopefully 50,000 foot view, you could imagine that, you know, once we have this stochastic process to capture that, then we can start, you know, really changing things in how we plan for and ultimately deliver to customers. Uh, but then the last thing that I wanted to kind of highlight is if you, you know, essentially, and like any stochastic process, this thing is going to step through time. It's going to be conditionally updated. We're going to learn, et cetera, et cetera. So as we move through time and we're learning, we're going to be updating that. Um, but what that means is that essentially we now have a framework for an autonomous supply chain because by capturing that whole set of potential outcomes and this understanding of as we evolve through time and we learn how we're conditionally updating, that means that in a sense we have you know, a conditional strategy, a conditional plan, regardless of what the world throws at us. And to me it's very similar to a self-driving car, right? In order for a car to be self-driving, as it goes down the road, it needs to essentially have a contingent plan for you know, everything that that might happen, right? It, it knows what it expects to see, the road, the lights, et cetera, but the dog could run out, you know, the weather could change, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the same notion. If we have through this stochastic view, then this dynamic stochastic view, in some sense, just what a self-driving car has, which is all those things that we could encounter. And then in number two, we've agreed, okay, if we encounter this, this is what we want to do, then we can really move in a much more autonomous way. And I thought it was interesting with some of the discussions that we're having today within the health context, I think it's a little similar, right? Um, we're doing with mundane stuff, like, hey, how do we get enough of the product at lowest cost, et cetera, but there's still debates to be had. You know, how much, for example, the, ser the sales focused person, the customer focused person of a company always wants more because they want to keep the customer happy. And maybe a finance person or somebody else wants to balance that with the risk of having too much or too little. So there's a lot of debates about exactly how these levers should be pulled with the end performance to the customer in mind. Um, but, you know, when we're talking about health and medicine, I think it's very similar. We're walking up with, hey, look, here's an analytic that could potentially help, you know, describe the best care to deliver, but the stakes are extremely high and the people involved may not be willing to cede control you know, to an autonomous thing. But um, you know, I think I mentioned, so moving from a full-time faculty member to an adjunct was really about learning how to do this stuff in practice. And I can tell you, you know, kind of <laughs> the short version of what I learned is because people today are not factoring in uncertainty, you know, they, are, they are betting on a particular forecast outcome, a best guess, then they are updating that when they realize it's going to be wrong. They are essentially in a highly manual, highly reactive mode. So we all planned on this. We all started marching here. Then they said, whoops, we want to go over there. Customer demand has changed. So we said, okay, we assume that direction. We all march over there. We all change again. And each of those changes are really messy because there are so many people and so many stages involved. So it becomes highly manual and uh, far, from, far from optimized. Um, and so it's, it's been um, surprisingly possible to make this kind of stuff happen. But you know, like I said, even though the, the decisions that we're driving are relatively mundane relative to health, 
I've developed a strong appreciation for the change management and for the, the local perspectives of people at each point in those activities. So um, again, just trying to you know, hopefully lay out this notion of, hey, if we can create an appropriate stochastic view of the future, that allows us to, you know, to really raise the bar on how we plan, from that, plan for that and, and therefore manage performance, trade-offs, risk, et cetera. But perhaps more, even more importantly, that means that we can move a lot more things into the world of autonomy um, because we really can specify policies that are robust and you know, executable through automation. So what I wanted to do um, was talk a little bit about number one. You know, again, kind of hopefully from this perspective of, hey, you know, um, if, if what I, the generalization I just tried to draw is true to some extent, then we're going to need this ability to generate these um, rich stochastic processes, um, you know, at, at, a, at a very large scale. So uh, I wanted to draw on a DNA analogy for doing this, and, and um, specifically, kind of parallel to what people normally do when they even just generating a deterministic forecast, certainly in retail, but in my experience, a lot of places, we, as analytic people, we go get data, and specifically, we get data about what it is we're forecasting. So let's say we're forecasting this particular product in this particular market. We go get historical data for that product in that market, and we use that to project a future. Um, I'm going to argue that you know, that is a very tough thing to win at. Um, and, and I think retail AI or retail applications make that very, very clear. Because the, even just a simple product, you know, it has a life cycle, right? Okay, this is this version of the Nike shoe. It's going to be introduced. It's going to be new for a while. It's going to be the regular shoe for a while. And then a new one's going to come in, and it's going to drop away. So you have a clear non-stationarity there. Um, and then there's all kinds of environmental factors that could drive, uh, you know, differential behavior as well. So there's just no way we could ever reasonably expect to predict the future from, from only the past of this single product. And when we move into a stochastic process world, it becomes totally clear, right? At that point, okay, I got it. You know, from a stochastic process perspective, I'm going to have one sample path. And I'm only going to have it when this product is over. So there's no way that I'm going to use you know, the actual experience from this product to choose this stochastic process. So if we wade into the data, um, what, what, uh, what we've been doing, and I think um, has some merit, is essentially to say, let's try and understand the DNA of what we're trying to forecast. So in a retail se setting, I listed some of the things, okay, what type of product is it? You know, what market are we selling into? What particular store, stage of life cycle, things like that. And then the environmental conditions would be, you know, from the macro, what's going on with the economy, to the more micro, which is, you know, is, our, is the competitor, you know, promoting the competing product, et cetera, et cetera. So we would then try and categorize products uh, store, really pairs of, okay, you know, what is this product and what store or what, re, you know, online retail site is being sold through and saying, let's identify products that have similar DNA. Then we can pool that data and understand kind of, you know, any product with that DNA will then be forecastable based on that shared history. Uh, and then we can further condition based on environmental, environmental behaviors. So uh, again, kind of like you know, people say, oh, is this clustering? Yeah, and it's a lot like clustering, right? So the question is, how are we clustering? So um, the thing that I wanted to highlight there is um, we're clustering on a very high dimensional space. So if we're essentially clustering on all the distributional parameters of a stochastic process. Uh, meaning, you know, in this case, it's all right, what is, in simplest terms, what's the conditional or unconditional distributions at various future points in time? So that's a very high dimensional space. So to me, that's why the DNA analogy is apt. Um, you know, in a high dimensional space, you need a massive amount of data to cluster purely from data. 
And so what we do, and again, hopefully this gets to the discussions we were having earlier about domain expertise, complementing and analytic expertise, is we try and do both. So we would go to a domain expert and you would, they would, you would say, hey, what products do you think are similar? You know, what stores do you think are similar? Kind of what's your intuition? We would use that to form a cluster, and then we would do our usual clustering analysis to say, like, okay, you're, you know, 80% right, but this 20% didn't fall in that space. So um, it seems to be working well, and it's, I guess, on that latter point, so main message, and then I'll wrap up, is stochastic processes, and not your garden variety stochastic processes, you know, stuff that's highly non-stationary and, you know, and has the ability to actually represent the kind of behavior that we see for highly non-stationary stuff. And then, you know, wow, we're going to have this super high dimensional space in order to fit that accurately and not a big enough data set. Well, let's use this kind of hybrid of uh, expert suggested uh, clusters, let's say, and with kind of analytic tailoring of those clusters. So I'll leave you with that. Um, and. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, hope it has some relevance from some of the problems that you're looking at if they're outside of retail AI. Thank you. We'll move to the next speaker and then entertain questions directly in the in the final discussion. So our next speaker is uh, Ikesh Nair. Um, and uh, he uh, was a, a professor, has been a professor at the uh, Graduate School of Business, professor of marketing uh, for several years, but just recently moved uh, to Google. Um, in, um, in terms of research interests and, and activity, has been um, uh, working at the intersection of uh, social sciences and, and the development of statistical tools for, uh, for marketing and for um, uh, decision making in, uh, um, in uh, marketing and in, uh, in business. Uh, so, Rikesh, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I was at Stanford for 16 years, and I'm missing it. Uh, I've been at Google for the last one year, and I want to talk to you uh, guys about uh, advertising. Mm. As you know, advertising is very important for retail, not just for attracting consumers, but also providing information about products, processes, etc. right? And advertising is a very data-driven field. Uh, we need data to measure the effect of advertising, to do bidding on auctions by which we, we, we buy advertising. And uh, the role of the data is very, very important. But what is happening right now is that the entire industry is in the middle of a transition because of a clash between the, the need for data-driven advertising, which requires collection of incredible amounts of data at scale from users, with the legitimate interests of the entire ecosystem to preserve privacy. So Google's doing a lot in this area, and they, all retailers and all of us who are interested in this field will have to adapt and change. So I thought I'll talk a little bit about what is happening. Um, it's very big picture. There are no equations, no graphs, et cetera. So please bear with me, and then uh, happy to chat more uh, uh, in, in Q&A. So I lead a data science team for Google Ads. We focus on measurement for all the ads, display, YouTube, search, et cetera. And there's a variety of topics that my team works on, including experimentation, data-driven attribution, online to offline effects of ads, brand measurement, third-party measurement with Nielsen and Comscore and others. But privacy is a huge issue that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, and that's what I want to talk about today, okay? And I thought I'll talk about it in three steps. First, let's talk about conversion measurement on the internet, how it used to work with third-party cookies. I'll give you a brief flavor for it and why it's problematic. Then tell you what Chrome is doing, what we are doing with the privacy sandbox, the new set of ideas uh, for the internet, and then briefly uh, finish with implications for the future. So why do we need to measure our advertising? Advertisers such as e-commerce companies, uh, for example, a Nike, and I'm going to give an example, need to understand what is the effect of advertising and more effectively allocate budgets and bids and things like that and optimize their business. Publishers, for example, on whom ads are shown, like a CNN.com, actually want to make money from their content. Otherwise, we'll have to charge for content, and they need to show the value of their ad inventory. And then ad techs, which are companies, intermediaries, like Google Ads or Meta or Criteo, which are intermediaries who will do the advertising, serving, as well as bidding, and 
optimization on behalf of advertisers. We actually need to show advertisers that we can optimize ads and do bidding and uh, do automation and things like that using ML models and show that we can help advertising. So for all of this stuff, the data is just very important. Okay. Text to dive in a little bit, what do we need to measure? What advertisers really care about is conversion. And what is a conversion? It's basically anything the advertiser cares about. At Google, we track more than 100 to 200 different types of conversions. Whether the user made an initial purchase, made a repeat purchase, it's up to the advertiser, okay? And we can track that. So the key is to understand whether ad exposure, which is an event, is associated with conversion later on, okay? So let me tell you how it used to work and what's the problem. This is how tracking currently works, and it used to work, and we're moving to a new paradigm. Let's take an example of an advertiser, Nike, a publisher, the New York Times, and an ad tech who is going to do the advertising on behalf of Nike, all right? And that's Google Ads. So Nike wants to show an ad, uh, an ad uh, on the New York Times, and it contracts with Google, and we show an ad on uh, the New York Times on behalf of Nike. So this is what happens. A user shows up at the New York Times, and uh, we serve an ad for the user. Google Ads serve that uh, uh, ad for the user. And um, so we are the ad tech, and the user, uh, New York Times is the publisher. And then what happens is that since I am Google Ads, I'm the ad tech, I serve the ad on the NewYorkTimes.com, I get to drop a cookie on the user's browser. Okay? And that cookie will have a unique identifier for the event that occurred, a view or a click. That's what I call an event. And since the entity that dropped the cookie on the, on the user's browser is different from the entity on which the user was browsing, which is the New York Times, it's referred to as a third-party cookie. All right? And this is how uh, events are tracked on the web right now. And then the user goes, let's say, to Nike.com and buys something on Nike.com. So now what happens is that Nike is delivering these ads through Google Ads. It implements some tags on Nike.com's website because we are the ad tech that's helping deliver those ads. And then the tag will report that conversion back to Google's, uh, the ad tech's ad servers. But when they do that, they will look, the tag will look at the Google Ads cookie that's on the browser and take that event ID and send it back to us. And therefore, we can tie that conversion event back to that ad click or ad view event, right? And this allows ad techs and entities like a Criteo or a data management platform to connect conversion events that are occurring on one website to ad interaction events that occurred previously. And that is really critical for pretty much all kinds of advertising use cases, such as how to do bidding, how to do conversions, and how to optimize advertising. Because we need to know what ads led to conversions or whatnot. To give you two examples, as an ad tech, I need to report back to advertisers what kind of ad campaigns are associated, what type of conversions, and then uh, pretty much all bidding on auctions now happens through automation and ML algorithms. So I need to know what ad clicks to uh, events to, to bid on, et cetera. So this is very important. So this is how it works now. But this is the problem. The problem is third-party cookies invented by Netscape all the way in 1996 were invented from uh, at a pre-ads time. Okay, and the third-party cookies allows ad techs, especially if I'm Google Ads and I'm, or Crite or some other very large ad tech, and I'm serving ads all over the internet, and each time I can associate an event ID, so now I can build a profile of cross-site browsing behavior of users. And leakage of cross-site browsing behavior is a violation of privacy, and users are legitimately responding to that. And then a lot of information is collected without not very transparent consent and things like that. There's more information that's collected than required. And then finally, user experience is poor. The site is very sluggish. Every ad tech is running a, a tag on the site and tracking, et cetera. And that's what we are seeing in the ecosystem. Users are responding to, to, to it by doing ad blocking, ad do not track, joining incognito mode. And we are seeing responses from the entire ecosystem uh, in the European Union, we have uh, GDPR. In California, we have CCPA. Apple has said that they will no longer support third-party cookies on Safari. Firefox has said no third-party cookie support on, on Safari. Google has announced that Chrome, which is the largest browser with 60% market share, we will no longer support uh, third-party cookies starting next year. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Android will follow suit. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is a bit of a very complex situation for the entire ecosystem because no third party cookies, no ability to associate and add interaction with the conversion event and a lot of things will break. So this is uh, a, so once we take that away from the web, what will replace it? Okay, that's the question. That's what I want to talk about today. But this is what we all don't want to, to be, uh, it to be replaced by, which is covert tracking using IP addresses and non-justified means, which is referred to in the industry as fingerprinting. Okay, that is something that Google has said we will not uh, support that on Chrome. All the browsers are are trying to fight that using uh, good methods. But there is a concern that if you don't provide some decent ways of doing good advertising, that we will have this so-called fingerprinting apocalypse face us. Okay. The other solution is use other kinds of PII, such as email IDs or phone numbers or something like that, and build an ID graph on the web. Uh, and Google's not a fan of this uh, because we feel that it replaces the thing that was doing cross-site tracking with some other identifier. So this is not the right solution. So Google's approach, and this is the approaches that many other tech companies are following now, is that we need to develop a more robust system that facilitates an open web, which allows advertising to be the main monetization vehicle while preserving user privacy. So we need privacy-preserving advertising. So the way we're doing that is to build in privacy preservation into the browser itself. The browser, Chrome, will act as an agent of the user. And the browser will connect a user's ad interaction and the, and the conversion event. Okay? But that data will remain within the browser. And when it goes out to advertisers, ad techs, et cetera, it will be anonymized, aggregated, and noise will be added to have formal differential privacy guarantees. Well, differential privacy is a particular mathematical way of uh, doing browsers. So Google's developing this. It's called the Privacy Sandbox. And all the major tech companies are having APIs to do that. Apple has a PCM API, Meta has IPA, and Microsoft has Parakeet. Google's efforts, which my team works on, is referred to as the privacy sandbox. I can't get into it in much detail, but I invite you uh, um, to check out the privacy sandbox website on the, on the internet where a lot of solutions have been proposed, and there's a sandbox for the web, and there's another one for Android. So once third-party cookies are deprecated in Chrome next year, all ad techs and the entire ecosystem will have to get reporting and data through these APIs, and then eventually for the smartphone on Android either. How will this data look differently? We're moving from an old world to a new world, where in the old world we had rich data, but it was not privacy-preserving, and it was leaking a lot of cross-site behavior. And users are legitimately responding to that, but we'll move into a new world in which data is still available and it can support some limited advertising use cases, but that data will be severely limited in how much cross-site information it leaks. It will be degraded in the sense that it will control how much information can be tracked, and it will be noisy. Uh, we'll add differentially private noise, for example, for those who are, who are actively engaged in that field, Laplace noise or Gaussian noise or whatnot, uh, in order to prevent privacy of any particular user from being uh, reverse engineered from that data. And there are many solutions and many algorithms for it. Many of them are getting built into Chrome as we speak. Another aspect is that a lot of tracking on the web was done by third parties, but a lot of now tracking and aggregation and, and connection of conversion events and, uh, and uh, ad interactions will be done by the browser, which acts as an agent of the user, and then reporting will be done through certain APIs, and that reporting will have noisy degraded data, which means that all subsequent downstream companies, ad techs, vendors, et cetera, will have to work with noisy data and get used to you know, differentially private data release and things like that. As you know, the US Census now reports data in a, with differentially private guarantees. That is what is happening right now. Um, previously, you know, there was, I can, could collect data on users and I needed consent, but there was no cost to it in terms of restrictions on what the quality of the data I can collect, but there will be a new restrictions coming on and it's already built into Chrome. Uh, for those familiar with this, uh, differential privacy, there's a concept of a privacy budget, and as you ask more information from the data, more noise will be added so as to preserve privacy. So there will be data acquisition under a privacy budget. So there's a restriction going on. 
The old system was developed for the pre-ads internet, but ads is free riding on third-party cookies, but the new system will be developed for, for specifically advertising use cases, but at the same time allowing advertising monetization to happen. Some other implications for uh, folks interested in uh, digital ads and digital marketing and, um, and quantitative marketing and things like that. Uh, it was always a data-driven industry. It's going to be even more data-driven and privacy-preserving um, for businesses and for a community like us, which is a science-driven community. More science coming in. Yeah, almost done. Yeah, one more slide. And uh, even more science and stuff coming in. Uh, businesses will have to become more sophisticated. There are new concepts such as differential privacy, privacy budgeting, and others that people will have to get used to. Um, clean data was available, reasonably clean data, but we added some models on top of that clean data. But in order to clean the data itself, now we will need models. And there's no concept of clean data. It'll all be noisy data and things like that. Uh, a lot of third parties were doing um, uh, data collection, but... Uh, there is going to be a huge role for first party data collection. So if you have a business and it has a really clean relationship with consumers on your own, that's a first party relationship, you can augment the available data from Chrome or Safari or whatnot with your own data and collection of that own data is going to be really, really, very important. So where's the future? This is the official Google POV. We'll have consented data with user consent, transparent user consent, first party driven. Okay, it'll be model, a lot of modeling is required and combined with uh, privacy-preserving technology at scale of the type that uh, I just spoke about. These technologies are developed in the open. There are GitHub repositories. We are working with uh, standard-setting organizations like the, the, such as the W3C and others in the open, and extensive commentary is happening. And the, uh, the goal is that it will move the web towards a more sustainable privacy-preserving uh, ad and advertising-driven uh, situation, and then the uh, smartphone after. That's it. Looking forward to comments. Um, and um, thank you very much. Thank you. So I, I invite uh, our speakers to maybe uh, take a seat in the, um, here and, and ask if you have questions to, to get started. Otherwise, I, I know that they have uh, a couple of topics that we can cover. But maybe as a start, if, if there are any questions, I'm happy to. Some search result that then appears on a different web page. You may be preserving privacy, but does that go away? And um, if it doesn't, then from the user's perception, maybe we're in the same boat. Yeah, it's a fair point. Uh, I think the practice that was uh, referred to is called retargeting or remarketing, where you saw a particular shoe on Amazon and then it follows you around, right? And the core problem of that is cross-site tracking and the ability to connect your behavior across sites. Uh, quite honestly, that kind of tracking will just go away. It will not be possible to do that anymore. Um, and uh, I think there is acknowledgement that um, if that behavior is done in an unconsented way without full uh, transparency to the user, that is problematic. And that is the motivation for um, and all of this. And um, the, uh, having said that, there might be some users for whom some reminder is useful and with full consent that might occur. So users can consent in a transparent way to be part of the privacy sandbox, for instance, at least on Chrome. And finally, there is some limited support that Google is building on the request of the industry for some kind of free marketing whereby users um, browsing will be anonymized and clustered into, hey, you browse sports sites, for instance, or you browse um, film-based sites, et cetera, in a public list, and then some limited information about the fact that this user is somebody who, has, who generally tends to visit sports sites will be available to ad techs, and they can choose to, um, to advertise on the basis of that. And that information itself will be noised with some probability. The truth will be revealed with some probability, one minus p. The false thing will be, will be revealed, et cetera. So that's called the topics API, and there is information on that. So the idea is to preserve use of privacy, but at the same time provide some ability to do uh, targeting. And users can self-select and say no to this as well. So that is where the ecosystem is going, consented, 
um, noised, aggregated, anonymized information uh, facilitated by the browser. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, so I actually had two questions. So the first one is, like, given now we cannot use third-party cookies, so how are you going to join the different events together? And the second one is, given the business is getting more and more complicated due to privacy, do you think life will be harder for the smaller players in the market? Thanks. Yeah, thank you. So on the first question, how exactly to join a, let's call an event, which is an ad click or a view associated with an advertising um, unit that was served to a user, and then a conversion, which is some activity related to purchase or whatnot, which occurs later. Now the browser actually observes both of them. And the browser can join them according to rules which can be specified by the ad tech. But while the browser does th that joining, data on the user level or data on which ads were associated with which conversions, when it reports that outside, it will be aggregated, anonymized, and noise will be added. So the, it's, the, it's in the reporting that privacy leakage will be heavily controlled. But the joining will be done by the browser. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we don't need cookies for that. On the second question, there is incredible amount of concern that small advertisers may be hurt by this change. For example, if lots of cookie data is not available to Coke, Coke may be still OK, or a Pepsi may be still OK, because they have other resources. But a small vendor in Palo Alto downtown who has a spa who needs to target users only in Palo Alto might be very hurt, because they don't have any other information, and fine targeting is required, which is why Google is building these solutions in the open with significant industry and advertiser and ad tech inputs, and at the same time building automation solutions for targeting measurement and others for SMBs and small merchants so that the, those activities can be automated. So automation will be very key for, for those kinds of players, uh, and that automation will require lots of machine learning. Um, uh, et cetera, right? Mm. There will also be a huge role for startups who can build and solve problems in this new environment. Yeah. I had a question for, for you, Blake. Okay. Uh, <laughs> maybe just, a, I know privacy obviously is very, very fascinating and, and uh, interesting topic for, for everybody. Uh, but I was curious about your uh, concept of uh, automation of, uh, of the supply chain. A and I was wondering what is the risk of uh, uh, potentially introducing biases or introducing some sort of uh, inherent sort of uh, mechanism, vicious cycle perhaps, that uh, favors, uh, favors yeah. some markets and not others and, and perhaps creates sort of a, an imbalance in the, in the system for, for uh, you know, maybe products or uh, I'm thinking also a supply chain for other application. I'm, I was thinking you know, before about uh, organ donors, for example, and, and things like that, where obviously you know, bias would be a, a really, really uh, you know, you important yeah, consideration for, yeah. for applications. I think, it's, I think it's a very fair concern. Uh, you know, in the, in, the, um, in the naive view, it's like, look, this is, this is just a company pushing supply, and then the, you know, the customer still walks into the store and goes to the website and says, well, I don't want that. You know, so there's a, you know, we succeed or fail, you know, and our bias would, would be a negative thing. But I think if all I see is X, right? Like, I mean, people say in, you know, in certain neighborhoods, only these products are presented or prices are different. Unfortunately, this would just help people do that better. So whether it's, you know, willing or accidental, um, yeah, I'd have to think about, you know, what we could specifically do to address that. Um, you know, the only thing I guess would be ideally, you know, in the same way from kind of, that's why I like the DNA analogy because it kind of helps us think, you know, people with different DNA have different proclivities and different risk factors and what have you. So the more that we could see that heterogeneity and the same thing about retail segments, then we could understand what would be most successful. Maybe that wasn't traditionally provided there, but, you know, the analysis suggests would succeed there or would be attractive there. Right. Okay, very good. Well, uh, let's thank again our speakers uh, for, for the session. Um,